you were just explaining how you and Fitness First have just been adapting to all the recent changes. Please go on. Yeah, so once once COVID hit, it's really funny. We actually started a few things in motion before gyms went into lockdown at Fitness First and we decided to put together a webinar series to help support our trainers. So uh, I'm kind of on the other side of it today. I've been interviewing yeah. a lot of people on our webinar series lately and we launched our first uh, our first webinar the day that the clubs closed. So we found out the night before clubs will be closing. Uh, we'd already had our first guest organized and we launched our webinar series that day. So that was probably the first thing that we did to adapt just to really support our trainers and support our team to get through what well none of us have experienced this before Absolutely. it was pretty hectic for the industry Absolutely. yes so we, we initially wanted to launch that for fitness first trainers and then the moment that we locked down we thought you know what let's open it up so we just opened it up to the industry so that anyone could join and it was really cool we had people joining our webinars from around the world really we've had guests on from around the world and we decided well clubs are back open but Zoom's a great tool, as I'm sure you're aware. And yes. what, why can't we just keep this going and keep providing support? So that, that's probably the first thing that we did. Uh, we sent out weekly emails to our trainers just with added tips on what to do. We took them through a step-by-step -step guide on how to basically adapt to what was going on, including mindset change, uh, including how to create online or virtual PT options, yeah. how to communicate with their clients, how to provide various options for them, and then how to have a bit of fun through Zoom and, and through online training as well. So we took them through all the steps to lead up to opening and uh, here we are. Gyms are, are back open again. So it's a very exciting time. Yeah. I mean, I think it's interesting to hear you talk about this because I have historically worked in private facilities as a coach for many years and my colleagues, they're the same. So we become quite insular and we have a bubble. And then there's the commercial gym sector and that's its own bubble. And I think unless we communicate, then there's stigmas and stereotypes that never get addressed. And I think the one thing I'm hearing immediately is that, you know, a lot of coaches in the industry, I think resent commercial gyms and their, their big corporate management. And one reason is, there's many, but one reason maybe because of the lack of mentorship or the lack of um, guidance and hands-on personal nature of trying to kind of empower and, and uplift and teach the coach. Um, but it sounds like, look, webinar series and um, trying to offer these through information through newsletters and stuff, that seems like a pretty good start to rebutting that conversation. Do you want to talk about how, or just address that and talk about you know the mentorship side that at least Fitness First do? I can't speak on other gyms, obviously, but your experience with, with that? Yeah, it's interesting, the, the stigma that, that is around it. And I think at the end of the day, whether you're a whether you own a, pro, a private facility or a boutique gym or if you own a big box gym, I think really at the end of the day, we all actually do want the same thing, which is to see personal trainers succeed in whatever it is that they do. Um, the support in each of those models can look very different and it can come down to the people in those, in those facilities as well rather than just the, the model itself. Um, I can't speak for all big box gyms, but the ones that I've worked across have dedicated PT managers or fitness managers or someone whose pure role it is to actually help those trainers to succeed. So here at Fitness First, our PT managers and, and fitness managers, they're all full time. And, and that's basically their primary role is to help support our, our personal training team, which uh, that, that that's something that we did during COVID. But just in the normal day to day for us, we have ongoing support for all of our trainers, including one on one development, um, coaching, mentoring, all of that takes place. Do all personal trainers within our clubs take up that opportunity? No, absolutely not. We've got trainers in our clubs that have been in the industry 30 plus years that are just not looking for that level of support and that's okay as well. Um, but uh, just talking for Fitness First and something that we're doing at the moment to help support our trainers post COVID is we put together a 12 week coaching program for them to go through to take them from 
basically day one coming back into the gym, knowing that most of their businesses have taken some kind of a hit. And I think most trainers around the world are probably feeling this at the moment and taking them through the, the step-by-step stage on how they're going to get to that, that state where they believe that they're successful. Um, and we've designed this to help support all of our existing trainers, not just our new ones. So we're not teaching them how to be PTs. We're actually helping to coach them and help them to problem solve for their own business on how they're going to get from where they are right now, post COVID, walking back into the door to where they see themselves, where they would ideally like to be. Okay, is that is that a, those are free programs or are those uh, paid like um, workshops? How do you guys structure that? Oh, all of the coaching and mentoring for our personal trainers within Fitness First is, is just part of, you know, coming on board with Fitness First. So that, that's at no extra charge. And we always really encourage our trainers to come along and attend. But also we know there's so many other great mentors and, and coaches out in the industry. And if we've got trainers that are engaging in a coach or a mentor that's that's outside of, of the Fitness First world, we're very supportive of that as well. Ultimately, we just want to see them succeed. Awesome. Okay. Well, you are the national personal training manager of Fitness First. I think that's a like a lofty title. What is that? I don't even want to know what that means. Like, what are your responsibilities, and how, how's it also like changed over this time? Great question. I think that um, a lot of people probably don't want to know what a national PT manager means or does. Um, my my role has a lot of different aspects. The one huge huge part of my role is to. Uh, put together programs, initiatives, structures to help personal trainers succeed. So that's probably the the largest part of my role, which includes the 12-week coaching, includes the webinar series, includes uh, helping us as a business to recruit really good quality people so that we can make that happen. Um, And the other really big side to my role is the the strategic business side of, of putting together different programs and industry relationships and making sure that we have things set up in our clubs to support our members to connect with a personal trainer or to connect with a fitness program of any kind regardless of what that looks like okay um all right interesting so you manage what probably sounds like thousands and thousands of people trickling down below is that not yeah not not quite so i don't i don't manage them um but but i support them okay and that's probably where Yeah, and that's probably where, you know, a lot of different models are out there in the industry right now. We have a combination of personal trainers for employees and personal trainers for franchisees. So, of course, our franchisees, they run their own business within our clubs and they don't have a a boss or a manager, but we're there to, to help support them and guide them through the process. Okay, well, I think that automatically kind of addresses some of the, you know, the the criticisms of commercial gyms. I mean... Speaking of that, what do you think? What do you think commercial gyms? And you don't have to name any in particular, but where where do you think they can improve? Like, where do you think the holes in the bucket are that that we can address as coaches and and even people in your your position can address from like more of a top down approach? Like, where are those little weaknesses that you see? Yeah, I think that COVID has showed. Um, within all businesses at the moment, their weaknesses. Yeah. No matter who you are, no 100%. matter if you're in fitness or retail or wherever I like you are, it. I think we need <laughs> show your weaknesses. So for us, and I think a lot of big box gyms, one of our weaknesses is definitely it's hard for a big box gym to adapt quickly when something like that happens. Um, there are a lot of really cool initiatives that small studios were able to do during COVID that we just didn't have the ability to do at that kind of scale and at the speed that we would have liked to adapt by. Perfect example um, was there were a lot of facilities able to hire out their equipment to their members Mm. on day one of closing down. Now, we got that up and running eventually, but a a facility the size of ours, that that actually took us quite a number of weeks to get that up and running, but we did. So that's probably one of the big areas where we can adapt. Uh, And I think not, not just speaking for big box gyms in general, there's a huge opportunity for people to, if you're in a management role or a leadership role, to kind of step out of your office and get into the club so you get a really good understanding of what's actually happening on the ground because, you know, they're they're the people within the business that are are really dealing with the members, they're dealing with the day-to-day, they're the people who um, really should have a a huge say in, in what needs to change and what needs to that within the business so that's a huge opportunity as well okay. for people to spend more time 
on the ground with the people in club seeing what, what, what day-to-day in the business looks like. Yeah, and would that come into a role of like a, uh, a floor, like a gym manager, floor manager? Not so much, I'm forgetting the exact word for it, but back in the day, um, there would typically be the, the coach who would walk around, you know, coaching and, and giving advice to all the members. That would be his or her role to manage all the members. It seems like in a lot of gyms now, it's more just your coaches renting space and coaching their own clients or coaching the clients from the commercial gym. Does Fitness First, like how common do you see that? Is that Does that exist within the Fitness First model or do you guys prefer we let our own coaches coach their clients or do you have like a, a floor staff who's going around coaching members? Because that's, that's a criticism I've heard previously. Yeah, it's, it's it's interesting that you say that because Fitness First is a business. We've actually been through this huge evolution where we've kind of gone through all of those stages. Yeah. We've experienced all of it and, and the model we've come up with now is what we believe works best for us within within our four walls but might not work the best for other businesses. But we back way back in the day when I first entered the industry, I started my career at Fitness First as a personal trainer where the only option was to become a franchisee. So as I mentioned earlier, you're running your own business within the club um, and there's so many huge benefits to that. You know, you get to work your own hours, you get to choose what you want to charge, who you want to train. It's your business and you get to run it within a club with all the support of having a a full membership base and a PT manager to train and and develop you. So that's the model that I stepped into when I first started many, many years ago, way back in the day. Uh, Then as a business, we evolved and we started to bring on gym instructors. Yes. So we still have the franchise model, but then we also had a gym instructor. Now, the idea was for the gym instructor to kind of learn the ropes doing what they're doing on the gym floor with the hope that they'll want to progress to become a franchisee further down the track. Some of the holes that we found in that model within our clubs was that they were doing a lot of a lot of guidance on the gym floor, but also a lot of putting weights away and a lot of admin tasks and a lot of member interaction, but not the kind that was actually going to hone in on their skills as a personal trainer. So the next step of this evolution was we removed the term gym instructor and we put in place what we now call a level one personal trainer. That way, I think the title in itself helps to, I guess, shape what that role might look like. But our level one personal trainer is a role that exists within the business for up to six months. And after six months, they get to choose whether they want to become a franchisee with us or whether it's not for them. And that's okay as well. But the role of our level one personal trainer as an employee is that they're actually functioning in our clubs as a paid personal trainer. They're training clients one-on-one. They're running small group training sessions, which we call freestyle group training. And they're actually on the gym floor as a personal trainer. So they have up to six months to hone their skills, practice what they've learned in their Cert 3, Cert 4, diploma, whatever they've studied. Keep building, keep building, learn how to become a PT, learn how it all works, build a client base, uh, meet the members, And then by the time they transition to become a franchisee, if that's what they want to do, they already have a client base there ready to go on day one. So they're not building from from scratch, which is what we had in the past. So we found for us that that's definitely the most successful model because for us, we kind of feel like it's the the best of both worlds. You get all the benefits of of being an employee and building a business. And then by the time you start as a franchisee, if that's what you want to do, you're starting with an existing business and already feeling like it's home for you. Interesting. So they would then just coach that level one trainer. They would just coach their clients, clients given to them by Fitness First. They would build their experience. Would they coach members or is that role of the gym instructor more redundant now? Uh, Within our clubs, it's a little bit more redundant, but we, you know, of course they're going to be coaching members. So they're to support our members. But the huge benefit in doing that is it's really the best way to get clients right, is right. To, to show someone your worth and your value and just what you can do to, to help them as a personal trainer is probably one of the most successful methods that we find in our clubs is 
in between those clients and in between those freestyle group training sessions is just to go out on the gym floor, chat to people, support members. And, and that is often what leads to the next client. Is that part of their responsibility or is that more of a, this is what you can do if you want? Yeah, so of course part of the expectation is that they are there to support the members and we are very much member centric as you know, members have to be the biggest focus of our business because without members, we don't exist, right? right. So that is definitely a huge part of their role. But uh, we've definitely gone way, way, way away from the days of uh, you are just a glorified cleaner. Except I have to say post COVID, we're all digging deep and, uh, and doing a lot of sanitizing and <sighs> And cleaning of the gym floor. So right now, I think we're we're all part time cleaners at the moment. No, absolutely. Early. <laughs> but it sounds like then it just it sounded like the gym instructor role, at least in fitness first. Well, one, it sounds like it it already exists in this hybrid role. But what I hear from I guess some people, I don't know what what gyms are associated with, is that maybe they don't feel like they're as a as a client or a member, they're not getting that service that's kind of gym instructor service do you realistically think that that exists like enough members can really feel that uh guidance from this love these level one personal trainers or do you think it's kind of too uncommon to for them to really you know get a feel for it yet that's a tricky kind of question i'm trying to phrase it do you kind of get what i mean yeah, yeah, I kind of do. And I, I do think that we have a, a high level of support there. Can we do more? I think everyone can always do more. Okay. Um, our freestyle group training, which is our small group training platform, is actually part of the membership. So they don't pay anything extra for that. So that's a, a really great way where we can funnel any members that do need that extra support that don't want to pay for personal training, can't afford personal training. It, it's, it's basically like personal training, but in a small group. And that's run by our level one personal trainers. So that's probably where we have that opportunity to provide that support. Okay. Um, for the, the comment that we sent you from Andrew Garwood, because we want full transparency. Like we love that. It's like we just want to have yeah. open, honest conversations and dialogues. Um, and I don't know what, what gym he's associated with, but he's a guy who believes that, you know, having a gym instructor is, is pretty important. Um, and having been in these gyms, the PTs only care about you if you're paying them. Now, this is an example of one person feeling maybe slighted by the service they got. How how do you how would you address something like that? And what do you guys have in place to kind of you know work through people who might feel like that? They just feel like they're a number, and that's a trouble about these big gyms, right? You have to scale huge amounts of people, and you have to try and make people feel valued, even though there's tens of thousands of them. How do you do that? Yeah, and I don't think that's a, a an issue that's necessarily isolated to big gyms, but yeah. it really does depend on the personal trainer. The, the best trainers out there are the ones that they know every member in that gym. I was in a, a gym earlier this week where one of the senior trainers, no matter who they walked past, they knew them, they were waving, they were doing like a from a distance fist bumps and they were they knew everyone within that gym so i think it really depends on the personal trainer the ones that have been in the industry a long time and the ones that are highly successful they are so successful because of that sense of community that they bring in i think it's definitely something that not everyone has um it, sometimes it's, it's just something that not everyone feels comfortable with engaging with that volume of people but it really does come down to the personal trainer um and as for the model there are there's so many different models out there what's best for the member i'm not really sure because i think that a member will choose to join a facility that they feel fits best for them and that's why it's great to have you know small studios and and big box gyms and boutique spaces and um things that are really honing into a specific niche because the general population can really choose that's for me that's my thing that's where i want to go and that's where i feel comfortable now, for a personal trainer, there's a lot of questions around which model works best for me as a PT. Do I go to one of those facilities? Do I go to a big box gym? Do I want to be a, a gym instructor, a personal trainer? Do I want to be employed or do I want to be self-employed as a franchisee, uh, a contractor, a subcontractor, whatever that might look like? And, and it, it's really the same as the question for the members. There's no right or wrong, in my opinion. It's just what's right for you 
as an individual. And some people are more suited to being an employee and some people are more suited to running their own business. Um, I think this benefits in both, which is why we have a, that blended model where we can provide an, an integration into running your own business, but it's up to the individual. Um, it's, it's funny, a lot of the people who now own facilities actually got their start in a big box gym as a franchisee, oh, yeah. as a contractor. For sure, absolutely. Yeah, so I think that the huge benefits to doing that is that if you have a goal of wanting to run your own facility, or whether you want to be in management of a facility, it's a really great opportunity to learn how to do that in a space that's full of members, full of support. If you've picked the right the right place, you've got you've got the support there, you've got the members there, you've got lead generation opportunities where you can develop those skills as a business owner and as a personal trainer so that when you go to launch your studio or gym or, or whatever that facility might be like for you, you're in a much better position to succeed than if you just come out of Cert 4 and you're trying to do it straight away on your own without that experience there. Um, which, which isn't the goal for everyone. Some people got into this industry because you know they want to study to become a physio down the track, and this is a part-time thing. Mm. And for them, that employee model might might be perfect for them, or maybe this is on the side of you know a psychology degree that they already have, or maybe this is a part-time thing just because they enjoy it and they like being fit and healthy themselves, and they did it more so for their own knowledge. So I think it really comes down to the individual. Yeah, and I think you made a great point where you brought up the fact that. Look, there's never been more options for a person to seek out the type of environment, type of coaching and service they want. And so if they're not content or with the service they're getting from whatever box gym, then they can seek boutique gyms, they can seek private facilities. There are so many options, but your model, the the uh, fitness first, that works for a lot of people too. And so I think just even acknowledging that gives people the, I don't know, just the, the, the sense of clarity that, oh yeah, that's, that's right. There, there are so many options. Commercial gyms are not the only one, but they work for a lot of people too. Yeah, and I think what we have, it's almost like a try before you buy kind of option for a PT is you start off as an employee where you, you know, you've got six months to see, is it for me, is it not? And if yeah. it's not, if you, we definitely have trainers at the end of that who go, you know what, I think being an employee is right for me. Mm. And then they'll look for opportunities within that space, which, which we support them with as well. What do you, because you, I think, and you think another good point you made is about the character of the, of the person, right? Of the coach, of the personal trainer. And that being like the determinant or big determinant to the service that members get. And if you, have, if you have bad people with bad character, you're gonna get a bad service. How do you guys, I wonder, how do you guys vet like the, the coaches and trainers? What are the standards that you see um, and that you kind of set? Great question. So I think, first of all, you definitely have to start a lot of this back in the, in the interview process to make sure you are finding the right person. And, and with our two models, if you are an experienced trainer in the industry, you can elect to become a franchisee straight away. And as an experienced trainer, you're going to have references. You're going to have train, um, sorry, clients who can vouch for you. You're going to have a track record in the industry. And if you're brand new, starting as a level one personal trainer, that that's kind of where we can find out a lot more about you and whether you're suited to the model. Um, but then once they're in our facilities and working within our facilities, that one-on-one coaching and mentoring from the PT manager or fitness manager can really help shape them. Mm. And that's what coaching and mentoring really is. It's not about changing a person, but it's about helping them to get the best out of themselves. We obviously saw something in them in the interview process, and now we want to really help them to mold that in, to help them become the personal trainer that they can be to succeed. Mm whether it's within within our facilities or outside our facilities. So it sounds like that first six month is is really like the, the breeding grounds to test them, to see if they're really a good fit and how far they can go? Yeah, and hopefully we, we've found that out in the interview process and quite often that starts before the interview where, where students are coming in for work experience and work experience is also very much where we find out whether someone's going to be a good fit for us or not probably more so than the interview process to be honest in some in some cases um, but once they've started with us we can just help them to hone in on those skills and and normally both parties at the end of that six months determine whether it's a good fit or not we we determine 
uh, with the trainer whether it's a good fit for them. And sometimes both parties agree that maybe it's not the right fit. Um, most times it is, which is great because we, we hired them for a reason because we saw something special in them. Do you sit down, have you sat down often for those interviews in the past or not so much? Yeah, yeah, I love interviewing. Okay, well, well, of course you do. In that case, <laughs> you would have seen so many different people, right? You would have seen all spectrums. Oh, yes. What do you think? <laughs> I'm sure you got some stories, right? Do you want to share any off the top? Maybe not. <laughs> Maybe that's a private conversation. But do you? what do you see as the commonalities between the best coaches and trainers? Like what character traits do you see they possess as a human being in person, skill set wise as well, that separate them and give them a point of difference? It's a good question and there's a few and some of them we can see in the interview process, others we don't see until they're, they're in the gym and they're working with us. Uh, one is you absolutely have to be good with people. It is a service-based industry. If you don't like people, this is not the industry for you. Yep. That's the biggest one. Um, above and beyond anything else, the second one is to to own your shit, <laughs> mm. your own stuff. So you need to, if you if you succeed or if you fail in anything you do in life, own that and own your part in that. Because most of the time, it's based on your actions and what what you've been able to do. And that's that's really a huge huge thing. Trainers who if something doesn't work for them and they self reflect and they go, okay, how can I do this better? And can they I want to do you better. There? Yes. I'm curious. Uh, I don't like interrupting people's train of thought unless it's something I get like a little thing. <laughs> um, but do you have a moment, I'm sure you do, we all do, in your career where you had that moment, where you, uh, like a failure moment where you're like, man, I messed up and you had that point of reflection? Yeah, I've had many of them. Do you mind sharing one of the ones that maybe come to mind that you're comfortable with? Yeah, sure. Um, and sometimes it's not a, a moment as soon as it happens. Sometimes it's down the track as well. But I look back to my first year as a personal trainer and there's so much of the stuff that I did then or believed then that I look back on now and think, oh my God, what was I thinking? Like so what? just as an example, there was a point in time where as a new personal trainer, I was one of the only females in the gym. I was one of the only female trainers in the area which industry's changed now, which is awesome. Mm. But back in those days, you had to really prove yourself as a female trainer. It was hard. People would always ask, but why would I train with you as a female? Why would, why would I hire you as a female? You're going to have to work so much harder as a female to prove yourself. So I felt the need to go out there and, and absolutely smash every client. No matter who they were, no matter what their goal was, no matter you know what their body shape was, no matter what their background was, no matter what their stress levels, their sleep, their nutrition is, everyone was kind of treated the same. Was I needed to work them to the point where, you know, I I at one point thought that them throwing up was success. Right. And I was almost proud of the fact. And I, I went to someone one day to say, "Oh, I had an awesome day today. I made four clients so up." And I think that was the moment for me. I was like, "Hang on." Is that what I see as success today that they threw up? Yeah. And that was probably a really big turning point for me where I thought, okay, that that's that's not right. I need to I need to find out more about my clients. I need to find out more about them, what they need, what they want. Um, and it probably sparked a lot of education for me as well. Going to courses, workshops, and I've always had mentors around me as well that have helped me to to become the best version of myself. So I really lent on them to take the next step. And, and from that point onwards, I don't think I had too many clients that up. Or if they did, it was not intentionally. Right. That's very, look, I appreciate you sharing. That's very honest of you to say because um, that, uh, that's a point of insecurity and that's a point of criticism that I think has been common throughout um, this industry is that the stereotype for a lot of traditional personal trainers, at least in the previous decades especially, is that you didn't get a hard workout in unless you made someone sick or if they're sweating profusely, right? And this misnomer perpetrated its way down and conditioned us, the population. And that's that's what people a lot of people think now. But now, it's like a reconditioning. Like, you, you don't have to sweat a lot or throw up to make an effective workout. Just like you don't have to eat until you're full 
to satiate your nutrition requirements. So one, I would just want to say thank you for sharing that. And two, do you have any others that you would want to share? Or is that the... Any other... Yeah, any, any other... other learning learning moments? Uh, there's another one that I would have to say um, is not so much a learning moment with a client, but more so for myself as a PT. And unfortunately, I, I've seen so many trainers go down a similar track to this. And it's probably something that's really important to be aware of is that you as a trainer need to look after your own health and fitness as well. Yeah. Your mindset, your your health and well-being needs to be in tip-top shape before you can help others. It's like the old thing of when you get onto an airplane and they say you have to you have to put your own face mask on yeah. before you help others. It's the same as a personal trainer. And and I went for a period, I think I was I think it was probably my second year in the industry where I was not doing that. I was working really long hours. I was afraid to say no. So I was booking clients in whenever they would ask. I would be in the gym from the moment it opened to the moment that it closed. I was doing boot camps on the weekend. I was doing everything that I could possibly do. As a result of that, I wasn't sleeping well. I wasn't eating well. I wasn't hydrating. And I, my stress was was up to here. As a result, and this is a huge learning point, and it's definitely not something that happens to everyone, but I actually know of two other trainers that this has happened to is I had what doctors suspected at the time was a stroke when I was 23. Really? So it was, yeah. So I was on my way to my first session of the day. I was about a block, maybe two blocks away from the gym where I had to get off the tram. I was living in Melbourne at the time. I had to get off the tram, um, call an ambulance, and uh, I was taken off to, to hospital. So for me as a trainer, that was a huge, huge turning point in my career where everything changed, absolutely everything, where I had to reflect and go, you know what? This is on me. I did this to myself. I really did. And things needed to change, which was spending more time managing my business better, managing my sleep better, prioritizing those things. And off the back of that, surprisingly, my business improved. My clients got way more out of me. Funny that. And uh, I got more time to myself. And looking back at it, I'm like, why did I not do this earlier? Probably because I was scared. I was scared I would lose clients. I was scared that people wouldn't. I don't know. I, for some reason, I thought that I had to work that hard to be successful. I think it's a, it's another thing we're conditioned to, and I don't think it's bad. I, I'm, I, for, not for a second do I want to like demonize working hard, but I think um, people almost trick themselves and they fall into the to the the rat race, right? Instead of making a conscious decision to deliberately work this and this and this and work on this, and they're they're just following the trends. They're just Oh, I see this girl or this guy do this. So if I need to get there, I need to do the same thing. Did you find like you you just had to like follow that trend and that inertia of the industry? Um, I don't think so. I think it was just me. That was just a hard work. I think there was something that, that I just had within myself because, mm. you know, the the word hustle wasn't really a thing back then. It that's, certainly yeah, is now. That's a good point. And, pe- yeah. and people really do think sometimes that you need to do that to yourself to be successful. But... Really, at the end of the day, I was able to achieve an even better result in a very different way. It was better for me and better for my clients. So hard work, absolutely. Every trainer needs to put in hard work, but but looking after yourself still needs to be number one. Yeah, you can do both. Yeah. You know, you can work hard on your on your business and your clients and on your own health. Um, when you were on that tram, what and you had what they suspected was a stroke. What, what did you feel? What was the symptoms? Um. I noticed that when I was back in those days, it was you, you had to put the coins in the machine to get your ticket. I was trying to put the coin in the machine and my arm wouldn't work and I Whoa. kept dropping the coins. And then I stood up and I realized that half my body had gone numb and I couldn't feel it. And so I called my mom and she's like, you might be having a stroke, get off the tram. And I was like, I'm not having a stroke. Don't be silly. And then my speech started to slur and Whoa. yeah. You might have had an yeah. actual stroke at 23. Yeah, they couldn't actually find a clot, so okay. it's still down as a suspected stroke. Um, but wow. they think there's a heap of contributing factors. Yeah, you burnout know, being a huge one of them. Yeah, you learnt a very hard lesson. I think do, I often wonder whether people need to experience like these really hard lessons in life to learn them. I mean, and to really create change in their life. Or do you think, I mean, you're in a position of, of leadership where you can be like, no, guys, this is my story. You don't have to make the same mistake. Or do you act, or do you think, a part of me thinks that, 
you know, a lot of people have to actually go through some involuntary suffering. Like, do you, how do you think about that? Well, it depends on the person. I'd like to think that by sharing my story, people can learn from it and go, you know, whoa, that that's actually not only possible, but also to know that I'm not the only trainer this happened to. I know mm. of two other trainers that have gone down this exact same road with suspected strokes. Wait, wait, wait. They have, with, oh, really? Just... Yeah, yeah. And both of those were also in their 20s. So it's that's actually, this this stuff happens and it might not be that. It, it might be just mental fatigue. It could be the outcomes of, of the stress you're putting on your body can be huge. But yeah, I, I hope that people can learn from other other trainers sharing their story around what what's happened for them so they can learn and they can grow i also hope that people who are surrounding them can help to identify when when something's not okay or something's off and be able to have a conversation with someone whether it's their their coach their mentor their club manager their colleague whoever it might be um some people may may unfortunately and i I really hate to say this but some people don't change until they experience some hardship themselves and that's just the harsh reality of life. Yeah. Yeah, it's scary. But um, I, re- I just recall you talking about earlier, you know, as a female trainer, you, it sounded like you felt like you had to prove yourself, you know, exercises and physical activity and lifting weights is typically a, a masculine dominated uh, activity, um, you could say, and especially back then. And so, like, I think you come with an interesting position where you have been coming up over you know, it sounds like over a, over a decade through this and you would have seen and experienced all different types of behaviors and trying to, you know, find your place, you know, in the industry. Who am I in this industry? And especially as, you know, back in the day, you correct me if I'm wrong, but it didn't sound like there were many female trainers at all. How did you, you know, think about, even discrimination against, you know, females in the industry and how that's changed and like how you're trying to address and communicate that stuff now. Did you experience that back then? Was that not so much? Yeah, absolutely. And it was everywhere. You'd you'd see it if you went to a course or a workshop, you'd be treated differently. Um, You would see it sometimes the way that you were treated by members would be different. I, I one day had a member that came up to me and told my client in front of me, you shouldn't be training with her because you, you can't train with a female. Females don't know how to lift weights. And yeah. and that was in front of a client. I was, I, was, I think, I think we we're on the bench press at the time and interrupted that to have that conversation. So absolutely. What is that moment? That- when you're in that moment, like that's, that's a moment where some people just, they just quit. They just be like, I'm done with this. Like I'm sick of this. What was your, where did you go mentally? Um, I respond to those things with a bit of an F you kind of attitude mm. where I, I, I'm normally like, let me show you why yeah. I should be here. Yeah. Let me prove myself to you. Yeah. Um, so back then it was, it was hard, but I'm really happy to say the industry is a very different place now. I, we have clubs where half the, the trainers are female. I'm so excited about that. I go into Cert 3, Cert 4 in fitness classes now. And in a lot of those classes, half of the students are female. That makes me really excited. Um, you don't have to be this this hard ass woman to to succeed in the industry now. You can be soft and gentle. You can be pre and postnatal. You can be someone who focuses on mobility. You can you can be all these different things and be respected and succeed. So that's something that excites me so much now. Is that what I felt then is not what I feel now. Is there still some of it out there in the industry? Probably. But it's it's nothing like it was back then. So the the future in fitness for females at the moment it's it's an exciting place. That's awesome. Um, what would you what would you t- as coming from the, the as a female perspective? Do you have any specific suggestions or advice for the young female up and coming personal trainer and coach? Uh, first one is just be true to yourself. Don't try and fit into the shoes of what what other people think that you should. So don't try and, and be exactly like someone else. You are an individual. Be true to yourself. And, and then secondly, there is a place for you in this industry. You just need to find it. So I, a lot of people give up really early because it's hard. It is hard. And succeeding in any industry is hard. Anything that's new is hard. But just just stick with it. Do it your own way. Find your own place. 
And um, yeah, I think the industry will be better for it. How do you think someone finds their own place? You know, this this extends now to everybody, males, females, whatever you are. Um, yeah, how do you find your own place in this industry? Um, I think one of the good things about COVID, because there have been opportunities in COVID, is people Absolutely. have had a lot of <laughs> people have had a lot of time to reflect. They've had so much time to reflect. I think that in itself has really helped. So people just need to reflect and think, you know, who, am, who am I really and what do I value and what do I want? Who do I want to serve? Uh, and even if you haven't had that time, it's it's a really good opportunity to ask yourself those questions and, and how does that relate to you within the fitness industry? What kind of trainer do you really want to be? Not just that you saw something on Instagram and it looked cool and I want to do that. But deep down, what trainer do you really want to be? Who do you want to train? Who do you want to serve? Um, and find people out there in the industry who are doing that. Okay. Because sometimes you might have this really cool idea and say, but everyone in my gym, they just lift heavy weights. Or everyone in my gym focuses on transformation or weight loss. Or, But I want to do this cool thing and I don't know how to do that. I guarantee there's someone out there doing it, whether they're in another city, another state, another country. But there'll be people around there doing that and you can connect with them. You know, that's what the internet is there for. You can connect with them and find out what they're doing and find out what's working for them and what their struggles on it are. And quite often, they're happy to connect back with you and, and happy to help you through whatever you need to to make that happen. And then probably the final bit that for me has really helped me was just having a coach or a mentor, which it, it doesn't even have to be a coach or mentor within the fitness industry, but I think it is important, especially as a new as a newcomer to the industry, that you have someone that you can bounce ideas off and that can ask you those hard questions so you can reflect on yourself and and decide what you want to do. Who has that been for you? Who's been a particularly you know powerful mentor and influencer for you over your career? I've had many over the years, I have to say. So when I very first started at Fitness First at the time, it was my PT manager. Um, he was a, a great mentor to me and his big focus was around education or especially around functional style training. So he was a mentor. Um, once he left, the next PT manager became a really good friend of mine. The following PT manager became a really good friend of mine. So for me, those P PT managers, when I was a personal trainer, those were my, my biggest mentors. I've done courses and workshops where I've really, really connected with the, the presenter or the facilitator and I've become friends with them and they've fallen into also that kind of coach or mentor capability. And then as I've progressed over the years up into management, um, I've had some colleagues that I, I feel are, are mentors to me and sometimes my managers and my leaders have been coaches or mentors for me. Do you have, do you have kind of a standout lesson or commonalities that these mentors all possess and that they've taught you? Um, probably something they all possess is that they all, they're all doing their own thing. They've all got their own stuff going on, but at the end of the day, they all wanted to see me succeed, hmm. which is really important to me. So that, that would be one thing. Uh, and a really good coach or mentor can see through the facade that you're putting out there and, and can see what's really going on underneath it and can help you to dig deep to find that. Mm, yeah, to figure out the real purpose and why behind what you do and who you are. Yeah, well, sometimes it's, I know for me, it's just to call me out on my stuff. Like yeah. one of my biggest, one of my biggest weaknesses is I don't like to ask for help and they call me out on that. Yeah. But like, you know, you, you need to get over that. So it's, it's great to sometimes have those people in your life that can see it before you do. That's so true. And help you to overcome it. How, that, that's, I, I resonate with that, you know, um, not asking for help. You feel like, I mean, you might feel different, but at least for me, you feel like you don't want to burden any, you, one is like you don't want to burden anybody. But then it's like there's an autonomy thing or it's like, well, I can control myself. If I can control myself, then I'm like, I build that integrity and that self efficacy where I can trust myself to handle situations without relying on other people. I think that's a part of it. Do you resonate with that or is it different for you? Um, yeah, probably. In part, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I do. And I think everyone's got their own version of that in some way. Absolutely. Um, well, let's backtrack to where where this conversation came from it came from you know trainers and coaches the interview process and the commonalities in the strengths that you see people in their point of difference and the second thing you said 
was they they wear their failures, I believe. Um, was that was that, am I accurately saying that? Yeah, yeah, that's pretty much right. Yeah. What? Please, I want to continue that conversation. What are some more points of difference? Because there's a lot of coaches, and you know, we're just in full transparency. Orfica obviously partnered with Fitness First, you know, as a referral organization. Um, so there's obviously bias, but we're, there's still a lot of help that we can have through this conversation, and that we teach personal trainers to become personal trainers, and then facilitate them over, and you guys may take them, um, and so. A lot of them are going to be listening. So do you have any others for the young personal trainers and coaches that you've seen that are stand out in your interviews that you think people should model, mimic, and try and become? Yeah, yeah. One one really big one is that uh, as personal trainers, quite often we can have our own agenda. And everyone, of course, has their own agenda of what they want to, what they want to do. There was an interesting study done many years ago, and it was actually done within Fitness First Clubs. It was run by a guy called Chad Timmermans. And the study was around why do clients leave personal trainers? So these are people who have started training with a PT and have left that trainer for whatever reason. And it was really interesting because the, the reason that they had initially told the PT and the, the reason they initially told told Chad was the, the typical things that we hear within the industry, it's usually time or money or family or work. It's the typical reasons why someone will, will stop training with a personal trainer. But the real deep down reason once he kept digging for most of them was that what they wanted didn't align with the agenda of the personal trainer. So they wanted something specific out of their training, but the trainer wanted something different for them. So those two agendas had not aligned. So someone who is able to put their client 100% first and what they want and what they need before their own agenda, that makes an incredible personal trainer. So an example of this is that if you as a trainer are training yourself if you're a bodybuilder awesome that's you through and through that's what you love to do you have a client that comes to you that says that well actually i'm not really a fan of lifting big weights but i really want to move better i just i just really want to improve my function so that i can i can maybe this is a an elderly person who wants to live longer in life now if that trainer then puts them into a bodybuilding program because that's what they like as a pt that member is not going to stay with them because that's not what they want. That's not that's not what's going to keep them there. But if they can adapt and give the member what they actually want and need as opposed to what you as a trainer would prefer to give them, you're going to have so much more success. And maybe over time, you can start to take them through some more weighted exercises and show them the benefits of that. But you've got to get their trust first. So that's just a, a bit of an example as to how that can play out and the difference between putting your agenda first versus putting your clients first and just being on the same page which really end of the day comes down to communication and back to those people skills doesn't it yeah no exactly that's that's a that's a great point and i think it's a it's a big mistake that a lot of early trainers make um with talking about the communication aspect the the skills it's like after you say like if if you don't like people it's probably not the industry for you what do you think are the biggest most powerful skills more softer skills like communication skills that people need to work on as a personal trainer and coach yep um people in communication is definitely one of them emotional intelligence is huge in this in this industry and it's a really hard thing to learn but being aware of it i think is really important understanding different personalities there's so many different uh, ways of doing whether it's personality profiling or there are many different methods out there to, to get to understand people better that's going to be a really big key and i know it sounds simple but probably the one of the most important things that i learned as a new personal trainer is listen more than you speak because it's not about you it's about your client they're paying for your time it's not your session it's their session that's a really big one yeah and you see a lot of or you hear about a lot of coaches and trainers who will uh, they'll spend more time talking about themselves, about what they did, about what's going on in their life. It's like a time for them to vent onto their client. And you're laughing because you've probably seen it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I think we've all seen it. How do you... It makes me wonder because how do you then have those conversations with the trainers and coaches who aren't doing so well? You know what? Maybe they suck. 
Maybe they're just they're just not good, right? How do you pull them aside and have the honest, open conversation to that can potentially elevate them to the to the next level and address their mistakes? Yeah, well, as a manager or a leader, this is where your people skills come in handy. This is where you need to be able to read the situation and find a way to have the conversation with them that's not going to offend them. And that's not the reason you're doing it. You're doing it ultimately, hopefully, to help them in their career. And if they can see that you're coming from a really good place and you put it across to them in the right way, hopefully they'll see what you're doing is ultimately for them. Um, And if you can help them to come to that realization themselves instead of you telling them that is the best way that you can so this is where your coaching skills really come in handy so instead of telling a a trainer have you instead of telling them that you speak a lot to your clients and uh they don't like it you could rephrase the conversation to to say in your your conversations with clients how how much do you feel that you talk versus how much do you feel that you listen and which of those do you feel that you could get better at as a trainer and if they can then reflect and come to that conclusion themselves that is way more productive than you just telling them that that is such a powerful thing you just said i think because i mean jordan peterson talks about it um you don't want to give people you don't want to fix their problem for them, right? You want them to be the, the driver, the, the, the person that they can come up with the solution. So if they come up with the solution and they figure out that process, you don't want to steal that from them because if you steal that from them, then it's very unlikely that they're actually going to create that change. And so I think provocative, thought-provoking questions, like you just said, that open-ended, that get them thinking instead of criticizing you present both sides i think that's really the key present you you understand the one that you think they need to work on but you don't tell them you just give them both sides and you see if they can honestly authentically observe their weaknesses and strengths yeah and then i 90 percent of the time that will that will give you the answer that that you were really looking for. They'll come back to you with what you were hoping that they would. With that last ten percent, you just might need to rephrase the question, ask it in a different way to come up with or help them to realize what what you're trying to to get them to. No, that's that's the art of communication. That's really powerful. Do you think um, what are the biggest mistakes? Then do you think you see young coaches and personal trainers make that they could avoid, especially earlier on in their career? Oh, uh, probably the opposite of everything that I just said. Don't, don't <laughs> communicate. Yes. Uh, yeah. Don't don't put your clients first. Uh, a few other mistakes that I, I see is that um, people, a lot of people are waiting for someone else to do the work for them instead of them being able to do it themselves. The, the opportunities to grow as a personal trainer are huge if you're open to looking for them. I mean, there are people everywhere that could use your help. But if you've got blinders on and you're just focused on you doing your own thing all the time, you, you're going to miss all the opportunities that you pass every single day. And those opportunities could be while you're waiting in line to get groceries at Coles, you're waiting at the checkout and the person in front of you turns around and goes, oh, hey, you're a personal trainer. Here is an opportunity for a really good quality conversation that could lead to a client. Or you could say, look up from your, your phone and say, yep, and then go straight back to your phone. Mm. It's two different ways you can look at that. So I think that's another one. Education is huge. And no matter how long you've been in this industry for, there's always more that you can learn. You're never going to know everything there is to know about this industry. So at no point do I believe a trainer should stop educating themselves. And yeah, there's courses out there, there's workshops out there, and and yeah, most of them cost money. But there's this thing called the internet. (laughs) To look for this stuff for free. Oh, guess is- what? Guess what we do every single week? Free conversations with some of the best health professionals and people like yourself across the world. Oh. Exactly. You've got webinars, you've got podcasts, you've got YouTube, you've got Google, you've got just endless tools out there to help you to get better as a trainer and keep developing. And the best trainers out there do that. The ones that have been in the industry for a really long time will always keep educating themselves. Um, if you if you believe that you don't need to educate yourself anymore and you know everything there is to know, there's going to be, there's a limit on how much you'll grow within this industry. Absolutely. Definitely some of the big ones. Um, some of the big ones I see, this is not necessarily once they start as a personal trainer, but in the interview process um, is not knowing 
kind of not not thinking about things from a client's perspective and putting yourself first with everything. Um, not dressing the part is another, I know it sounds really simple, but it's a big one. Don't just come off the gym floor with your torn sweatpants and, um, you know, your your muscle shirt on and then come straight off from there into an interview. It's probably not going to come across the best. I would always say dress for the part that you want or that you're, you're applying for, not the one that you currently have. Uh, interacting with everyone in the facility in a positive way is so important. Uh, when I'm interviewing someone, I love to ask the receptionist how that person treated them when they came that's in. That's a great point. Wow. Yes. Because that's the way they're going to treat members. Um, they're, everyone's going to be their best in an interview. That, that's not where you get a really good idea of who someone is. But, yeah, asking the receptionist or if you notice they were out chatting with a personal trainer before the interview, I love to ask the personal trainer, hey, what did you think? What did you chat about? How did that conversation go? And in their work experience, when they're coming into clubs for work experience, think of it as like a mini interview because that's where we really get to see who you are and what you're like. If you are on time, if you're presentable, if you ask questions, if you're engaged, these are all great signs that that's who you really are as a person versus someone who might be late on the phone the whole time, constantly disappears, doesn't engage. It, it really it goes a long way to getting your foot in the door if you're presenting yourself in the right way. Great point. And that that ask the receptionist thing is so useful because you're trying to get a little hack into like, all right, how do they, just a little honest, little brief moment of interaction. Did they say hello? Were they rude? Were they distracted? I think another great thing is like, you know, this is a bit unrelated, but on human behavior, it's like if you're on a date with somebody and they treat the waiter or waitress terribly, that's a terrible sign, right? How they going to yeah. treat you over the long term if they're not treating that person with some basic respect and so that's great it's good i've never thought of it with that analogy but that that definitely works yeah you, you can use that one too i'll take yours <laughs> i'll take mine um so, so i'm just gonna plug my power into my laptop just give me one sec no problem um we're coming to an hour pretty soon anyway um but yeah, so you just highlighted some of the, the big mistakes that a lot of people make. Um, are there any others? Do you have any, like, pleas or asks or suggestions for, for a lot of these coaches or trainers that, you know, we haven't talked about already that you would encourage or want to talk about? Yeah, one, and I think this would just, this would change the industry so much is that, you know, stop seeing everyone as your competition. Yeah. Whether it's another personal trainer, whether it's another business, whether it's a, another brand, if we can stop seeing everyone as competition and actually start collaborating and working with people, we can make such a big difference to our businesses, to the people that we're supporting and the communities around us if we work together. So that small mindset shift will go a really long way. And that's no matter what your role is within the, in the industry, instead of competition, think about collaboration. Absolutely. I mean, because it's like, uh, I don't know if you've heard, um, what is it? It's called zero, there's a term called uh, the zero sum game or zero sum kind of analogy. Have you heard of that before? No, I haven't. It's like there's a pie and there is only like a hundred pieces of the pie. And once a hundred pieces are gone, it's all gone. And it's like that would represent maybe clients or money you can make in this industry. And I think a lot of people treat this industry from that perspective of competitiveness where, oh, there's never been so many personal trainers and coaches. There's never been so many exercise science graduates coming through. Um, you know, that means that the supply for uh, coaches and trainers is so high and so there's there's going to be less business there's going to be less people to work with less money to make but it assumes that the pie isn't changing and, and we know that we can all be successful and effective in this industry by even more so by working together we don't have to take or steal or knock down other people's buildings like Gary Vaynerchuk would say you know, be, be, build the biggest building by being the biggest building instead of trying to knock everybody else's down. And I think that's a great point you mentioned um, that I think is a kind of pervasive... It comes from the competitiveness. It comes from like this this A-type personality, Michael Jordan-esque dominance type of thing, which I love. But 
a team. You, when you, uh, Michael Jordan worked at a team. Like he worked with people. Like you have to work together to ultimately go far. So I just wanted to comment on that. If you have anything to yeah, say on that, I love that. I love that analogy. And there really is enough to go around for everyone. As a the, the population is is not getting any slimmer. No. They're not getting any healthier, no. and it, and it's growing. So the, the opportunities are huge. And post COVID, some of the opportunities right now is that there's a lot of trainers who have been in the industry for a while who kind of fell out of love with it a while ago and COVID has probably helped to give them the prompt that they needed to to move on and there have been a lot of trainers who have left the industry and the opportunity is that the ones who really want to be here and want to put their everything into it they're here they're back they're ready to go so the industry is going to have so much more energy into it and it opens up the door for all of our new people coming through Cert 3 and Cert 4. There's now a new wave of fitness professional coming into the industry. Um, and it's going to be a, an exciting place. And the members and the, the clients that are out there have had all this time in COVID to think about what they want. And the yeah. ones who've decided that, you know, health is what I want, fitness is what I want, this goal, that's what I want. They're coming to you as a client knowing that they want this rather than you feeling like you need to convince them of it. Yeah. And the moment that our doors reopen, I know a lot of businesses felt the same, is we, we weren't really expecting in the first few weeks many sales and, and we were just inundated really by people wanting to join. Of course, there were members who, who've, who've moved on during all of this, but we had an influx of people that wanted to come in and use our facilities and we weren't expecting it, but how cool is that? There's so many people that through COVID have said, no, now is the time I'm going to get my fitness back on track. Well, here's the thing that none of these health authorities on the TV are talking about. I know Joe Rogan talks about this all the time, but we're going to talk about it right now. Why <laughs> do we, we, we say all these things about masks, sanitization, you, 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 we say all the time, you know, closures and lockdowns and this and that, but why aren't we talking about to, like how improving one's health dramatically could dramatically minimize the effect of our healthcare system and this virus and all future viruses and, and bacterial infections? Um, why, why don't we talk about that? Why don't we talk about having a conversation where, hold on, may, maybe like an allied health professional, physiotherapist, they can stay functioning. They are an essential service. Well, hold on. Why aren't personal trainers and coaches? That's that's prevention and that's being proactive by using that service instead of being reactive. So how do we get there? Yeah, I think the, the question or the, the conversation needs to start with us. It needs to start within the industry and we need to start sharing that message. And the more that we, we do that and the more that we speak up, the more people are going to listen. Good. Well, hopefully this conversation has illuminated um, <laughs> some of that I wonder I think that's a thing that people also didn't expect that I, in the circles that I'm hearing that I'm in you know they expect a lot of commercial gyms to dramatically suffer in this time and it's true to an extent when you're closed you're closed right maybe there's not a lot of pivot positions that a commercial gym can go to um, to keep the members paying whereas maybe private facilities can move a little quicker because they're more mobile um, but to hear the influx of people seeking out your services, I think would, would surprise some people um, because especially I wonder, do you, a lot of people investing in their own equipment, building their own home gyms, is there any way to quantify like how much even that has affected commercial gyms or fitness first? It definitely has, but I don't think that's necessarily a negative thing. That's awesome that people want to prioritize their health and fitness. It's, it's not a bad thing that more people are getting active and, and members have done that. They've bought their own equipment and set up their own home gym or they're training outdoors. Also, more trainers have done that. More trainers are working outdoors. More trainers are working online. And, and that's awesome. Yeah. The, the opportunities out there to help people get fitter and healthier have now just, just expanded massively so i think that's a really good thing and um yeah whoever got into a fit equipment manufacturing pre-covid smart move absolutely <laughs> yeah a lot of people uh made a lot of money and look they they found an opportunity in an adversity and so i guess i want to finish this conversation was with where has been where do you think the main opportunity in this adversity is for yourself personally and then from the larger population, whether it's fitness first, and then beyond that, as like a population, 
um, in this industry? You can kind of pick what layers you want to talk about. Oh, there's a, a lot of things to think about there. All right. So for myself personally, I see this as an opportunity to try new things, to pivot and to support our trainers in a different way, which, which we're doing every day. So we're learning, we're evolving. We've learned so much through all of this and we would have never done some of the things that we've done if COVID didn't happen. Some of the, the webinars we've done, the online training we've done, where we launched a, a fitness first at home platform, we, we wouldn't have done that if this hadn't happened. But the, the value in that is going to be huge. The opportunities for, for members out there is that there is so much more an offer for them to, to train wherever they want to, whether it's online, whether it's at home, um, through their screen, whatever that looks like, whatever kind of gym that looks like for them, the opportunities have increased. The opportunities for personal trainers to have a better work-life balance now that they've all learned how to use Zoom and uh, Google Hangouts and, and Facebook Lives, their business capabilities have just increased, their work-life balance capabilities have just increased. So that's awesome they've got out of their comfort zone yeah they've gone through a, a hard times to get there but where they are right now that's a really cool place and just for the the global population if they they understand now more than ever how important health is and if they're not if they're not prioritizing right now it might be because they're still in that that space of being scared or not knowing what's going to happen but it is it, even though gyms were not one of the first things open People see it. People understand that health is so important. So I, I really hope that in the coming months, in the coming years, that we just see the, the health and fitness industry and everything that connects to it just boom. I think that's a great place, an optimistic place to end this conversation. Tani, thank you so much for your time. And I really enjoyed this conversation. And do you have any last parting words, comments, thoughts, asks of the audience where people can find you uh, before we finish. Uh, just thank you so much for, for tuning in. Uh, I really appreciate it. If anyone has any questions at all, uh, probably LinkedIn is where I hang out the most. Um, just Tani Donkin. Um, you'll find me there. I'm the only one of me in the world, so it <laughs> won't be too hard to really? find. It's pretty good. Uh, yeah, and, and on Instagram at Tani Donkin Fitness as well. Uh, if you have any uh, specific questions about, especially for students looking for work placement or, or opportunities within Fitness First, you can email me if you like, which is tinydonkin at fitnessfirst.com.au. Um, as of in a few days' time, we're actually going to be opening up uh, level one personal training opportunities. Yay, we're recruiting again. We're super excited. So there, there's going to be a lot of opportunities across Brisbane, Gold Coast, Sydney, Canberra, and Melbourne. So um, next few days, we'll have some adverts out and uh, anyone who's already completed their Cert 3 and Cert 4 and is looking for just even to find out more information, hit us up. Awesome. Thank you, Tani. Thanks for having me. I really enjoyed it. Awesome. Appreciate you coming on and taking the time. Thank you. See you next time. All right. See ya. I'm going to wait for you, Tani, to hit that end button. Boom. I <laughs> Boom. All right, guys. That's uh, that was that was a be that was a good conversation. Um, better than I anticipated. We went off into a bunch of different topics um, that were quite resourceful. Um, anyway, speaking of Cert three and four, if you guys don't know, Orphic Education is a certificate three and four company. We deliver one of the best and most comprehensive certificate threes and fours in fitness um, in the country. That is, as a teacher of it, as an owner of it, as, as someone who is seen the curriculum and teaches the curriculum, that is my biased perspective. So if you want to be a part of that and you want to become a personal trainer and coach, get onto us as soon as possible because we're having our last practical intakes for the year. In the coming weeks, from Sydney to Athletes Authority uh, to Body Seek in Melbourne, um, peak is just uh, is, is just about to start um, in South Australia. So if you're interested, get onto it. Otherwise, we do this every week. Webinar Wednesday, Orphic Education. We talk to fitness professionals, health professionals, people from all over the country, trying to have open, honest conversations. We've talked to a lot of people 
Um, you can see at allficeducation.com forward slash webinar Wednesday uh, exactly who we've talked to and who we're going to talk to next. We've got Steph Lowe next week. Who We're going to be talking nutrition, nutritionists. I'm really looking forward to that conversation because nutrition science is a big topic of interest and conversation and uh, you know uh, part of my profession. Um, so stay tuned for that. Next Wednesday, 10 a.m. If you want to be informed of when these come up, when these come out, put your name, email in the inquiry form on the website or for education forward slash webinar dash Wednesday. You can see all these on YouTube, every single podcast platform. These are going to be out there. Appreciate you guys watching. Any comments, questions, complaints, or queries, let us know. Otherwise, I'm Alexander Emanuel. You can find me on the internet somewhere. We're off education. Thank you for watching. See you next week. Oh,